you're listening to Sunday Sequence. We're going to do our main debate now and scientists hope to have a select group of people living in controlled conditions on Mars within the next 20 years. If mankind eventually repopulates to another planet, perhaps forced to do so because of global warming, what place, if any, would there be for religion? And if religion were allowed, which faith would work best? Now, we're not debating the scientific and ethical challenges of relocation and colonising. We are debating the theory of religion. Is it essential to life or is it merely useful means of keeping people in order? Our guests this morning are Beth Singler, an anthropologist who has researched the development of new religions. We're also joined by Professor David Wilkinson, who's a Methodist minister and professor at Durham University. He has PhDs in both astrophysics and theology. And we're also joined by Michael Nugent from Atheist Ireland. You're all very welcome and thank you for joining us. David, I'll start with you. It's not a new debate, is it? I mean, scientists and religious thinkers have been contemplating the role of religion and space for centuries. Oh, absolutely. A lot of our speculation about other worlds goes back to some of the early Christian thinkers uh, who saw the vastness of the universe and theologically asked the question, might there be other worlds out there? Might God have created other um, life forms? What are those life forms there for? And interestingly enough, um, will they share similar religious feelings? Will they have experienced the goodness, the transcendence of God? Might they have fallen into sin? C.S. Lewis wrote science fiction about this, saying, might religion be universal and what kind of religion might be universal? But fundamentally, this sense that there is some kind of transcendent exploration Uh, that the universe poses, that there's something about the universe that raises the religious question, has been there for many centuries. Beth, does a plurality of worlds, though, militate against the truth asserted by the Christian religions in particular? Uh, Not necessarily. Uh, There's much debate as to whether there be other worlds with other similar systems of religion and belief or whether perhaps Jesus had arrived somewhere else at a previous time. Uh, We should also bear in account that other races found on other planets might have their own belief systems that might affect us as well. We've certainly had speculation about that in science fiction. Um, In particular, Heinlein's novel Stranger in a Strange Land proposes a water-sharing community that then returns to Earth and spreads through an almost messianic leader. Uh, We have to bear in mind how some of these science fictions play out in the real world. So the Church of All Worlds has picked up this idea from Heinlein and exists as an actual church still today. But David, are evangelicals most hesitant to support the idea of other worlds because they, in terms of reading the Bible, it's God made heaven and earth, only earth. No, it's very interesting. Just a few years ago, Ted Peters did a major survey of uh, Christian believers. What he found was that, not just Christian believers, incidentally, but other faith communities as well, what he found was that there was an overwhelming majority of folk who were religious believers who didn't have the slightest worry about the discovery of other lives, uh, other intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. He also surveyed those who weren't believers, and there was an overwhelming majority of those who weren't believers who said that believers would have a problem uh, with life elsewhere. So Christians and evangelical Christians, indeed, don't seem to have that problem. Now, the reason for that, I think, is that, as Colin Russell, the historian, pointed out a number of years ago, within evangelical Christianity particularly, we are special not because we're at the centre of everything, but because of the generous, gracious gracious relationship that God has given to us in Christ. That is, what makes us special as human beings is not that we're the only or the centre of everything, but that God has an intimacy of a relationship which he's shown through Jesus Christ. And therefore, that gives me security, that I know that I'm special, I'm loved, whatever is out there in the universe. Michael Nugent, Michael, you're always welcome to Sunday Sequence. It's been said that if religion is to survive, it must embrace space. What's your thinking on all of this? Well, I think the further uh, you look into space, um, a a universe, an observable universe of over 100,000 million galaxies, each of which is over 100,000 million stars like our sun, the more you realise how insignificant Earth is and how insignificant humans are in the overall scheme of things. Even if you just look on Earth, I mean, there there have been uh, 5,000 million species on Earth, 99% of which are extinct and humans are likely to become extinct or evolve into something else. So I think we've got to start by recognising that we're not the centre of everything, we're not special, we're one of a vast amount of species on one 
of a vast amount of, of planets in a, in, a, in a vast universe. And if we are to start again elsewhere in terms of colonising someplace else, you know, we have an opportunity to skip some of the evolutionary stages that we have had to go through of trying to figure out what's real and, 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 and what, what's moral and go there with the benefit of what science has taught us about reality and not have to depend on imaginary explanations. Uh, Beth, just listening there to Michael saying, you know, with the, the discovery of all of this shows how insignificant Earth is. Is that a problem for those in, in certain religions that they're thinking, if we are not God's special creations, then who are we? Uh, I don't believe so. A lot of different faiths have a place in the cosmology for humanity, um, broadening out the, the scope of the, to look at things like the New Age movement or new religious movements. They often place humanity within federations of planets, and obviously there's a science fiction influence on that idea as well. There's not necessarily a diminishing of humanity because we connect with other int potential intelligences. Well, this whole issue, space travel and religion, they've almost been inextricable since the first departure from Earth. I want to play a clip um, from Mission Apollo 8 in 1968. It went to the moon in December of that year. And on Christmas Eve, the three-man crew made a television broadcast where they read the first ten verses from the book of Genesis. And here is part of it. And uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 have a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. That's from 1968. David, I mean, reading now about a potential new mission to the moon, um, Professor Igor Mitrofanov from the Space Research Institute in Moscow telling the BBC News, we have to go to the moon. The 21st century will be the century when it will be the permanent outpost of human civilization, and our country has to participate in this process. Do you believe that that is the next battle, where the next battle for religion will be? I don't think it'll be a battle at all. I think it's absolutely right that we need to go to the moon. I speak as an astronomer, and one of the things that uh, the moon offers us is a, a very good place to do astronomy and uh, uh, to um, build telescopes that are uninhibited by space and some of our low orbit um, interference. And so there's something very exciting about going to the moon. But I don't think it'll be a battle. I mean, the reality is that religion goes with us because we're human beings. And we know that between 40 to 60% perhaps of scientists will have some kind of religious faith they'll be taking that to the moon uh, we know something about the fact that when we encounter the universe and as Michael said with all this vastness there are questions uh, questions which we want to talk about which we want to think about and religion has a part to play in that so I don't see it's a battle interesting enough of course um, the first meal ever shared on the surface of the moon was when Buzz Aldrin took out of his spacesuit a little piece of bread and a little bit of wine. And uh, as they landed on the moon, uh, Aldrin uh, administered Holy Communion to himself uh, as a way to say that here he was as a religious believer at this new frontier. Michael, what do you make of all of that? The, the How closely linked religion and space are? And as David says, you know, people with religion, people of faith will go to the moon and, and, and other planets. But the theory of religion, is it essential to life? Well, first of all, in terms of, uh, of people going to the moon and administering communion to themselves, that's a, a terrible insult. Even if you're religious, that's a terrible insult to all of the other religions in the world who have different uh, beliefs about how the universe is created and different beliefs about God. If, if we are, as a race, trying to colonise space or find out more about space, we should do it in a sense of respect for everybody rather than just trying to impose our own religious beliefs on something like that. How is religion connected with humanity? I mean, there's the old joke of, of an Irish man stranded on a desert island and he's rescued years later and he's built a house and a farm and two churches 
And the captain of the ship that rescues him asks him, why has he built two churches? And he said, well, that's the one I go to and that's the one that I don't go to. So, so there is a tendency for, for uh, humans to not only believe in gods, but believe in specific versions of gods and separate and, and segregate on the basis of, of those beliefs. And hopefully if we are in a position of, of ever starting again, you know, we'll, we'll be able to know that that's harmful. We'll be able to, to, to know that that... Uh, for example, if you look at the, the, the results of the World Values Survey, you'll find that, that as, as people move away from survival values towards self-expression values, that that enables societies to move away from traditional religious values and towards secular rational values. So there's a lot of things that, that, that we used to think were the case that, that we now know isn't the case and, and we should take advantage of that new knowledge in trying to overcome those, those old mythologies. Do you agree, David? No, no, I don't. And I think I respect Michael a great deal, but I, I don't think that to be real about one's own faith uh, is attacking other faiths. I think we have to accept that there's a complexity in humanity and to simply say that only those who are atheists would have the privilege to go into space or let's start again with no religion and let's deny it to those astronauts or scientists who are going to be living on the moon, I think is far too simplistic. Uh, our complexity as human beings means that we have to find ways of living together uh, with all of the challenges that different faiths and different faith communities uh, give, but also the opportunities that that gives. Yeah, I didn't suggest for a moment that, that only atheists should be allowed to go to space. What, what I said is, is that, or what I hoped to convey, is, is that depending on the capacity in which people are behaving, if they're behaving on behalf of the entire community that has sent people to space, that they should respect all of the different beliefs rather than just their own. Which I would agree with completely, Michael, absolutely. And I think Christians, um, as well as anyone else, would have that challenge and that opportunity. Beth, do you want to come in there? Yes, if we're talking about self-expression, I don't think you find a stronger self-expression of humanity's creativity uh, other than in the development of new religious movements, especially those that don't call upon some sort of revelation for their creation, but are actually pragmatically expressing their understanding of the cosmos. What, so do, what, do, you talk, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, his argument that we move from survival mode to self-expression mode, new religious movements create new narratives that are aware of their createdness and therefore they don't rely necessarily on a charismatic leader or a, a revelation of what truth is. So things that have developed from wider narratives in society are expressive, are creative in that way. If you were starting again, Beth, in mm. space, what religion would be established there, if any? Well, I think we have to pay attention to the effect of geography on religion. Most of our main religions developed in the same geographical area on Earth. What kind of impact would a completely different planet have on our mythologies, our narratives, our way of understanding the cosmologies of the world? So a red planet versus a blue-green planet may have a very different effect. D David? I don't think we're starting from a blank sheet of paper. I think that's the interesting thing here. I think Beth's interest in new religious movements is very fascinating in terms of um, stressing context and the way that we build upon those already existing religions that are there, sometimes by rejecting them, sometimes by enriching them and building on them. And, and I think we can't start with a blank sheet of paper if we go to a new world. We will be bringing with it our history, our culture, our philosophy, our differences. And for me, Christianity is part of that and a very helpful part of that. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I suppose, does feed into the, the colonising debate and whether or not that's ethically correct or not. But, Michael, you would argue, presumably, that why the need for religion at all in space? But what would happen without it? Well, what would happen without it is that people would be healthier, people would be happier, uh, people would be less nationalistic, less ethnocentric, less uh, racist, less um, dogmatic, less authoritarian. There would be less serious crimes, there would be less teenage pregnancies, there would be less abortions. There's loads of research that shows that the more secular a society becomes, the less of the problems that one is typically told that religion solves are actually happening. And it, the, if I go back to the point that I was making earlier on about the, the World Value Survey, that's not just my opinion, that, that's a team of interdisciplinary disciplinary social scientists around the world who have been examining 
human values around the world and what they're finding is that when a society has more investment in, in health and education and communications technology moves towards democracy, moves towards a, a perceived at least self-control of, of, of your own life, that that is what enables the move from people going from survival values towards self-expression values and that is what triggers moves away from traditional religious values and towards secular rational values. So it is happening anyway. The question is if you go to a new planet, are you going to be starting again and, and you know, uh, I suppose it would depend on what people we send. You know, there's going to be choice about who do you send to colonise these planets, what particular subset of humans, and that would determine how things would evolve from there. And David, listening to Michael there, it, his argument certainly seems to suggest that religion is, is not essential to life, that it is merely a useful means of keeping people in order. No, I don't think so. I think the sociological data is far more complex than that. And I think... Uh, um, one of the things that we'd have to do, and I keep coming back to it, is to accept that we don't start with a blank sheet of paper. For the last three years or so, I've been in, in, involved in a very interesting conversation at CERN. Uh, following the discovery of the Higgs boson, the Director General of CERN, Rolf Hoyer, has drawn together philosophers, theologians, scientists to talk about the big questions. Now, that's not to say that uh, any faith community is privileged in talking about those big questions, but they are the kind of big questions that fascinate us. And as well as bringing our religion, I think these big questions of who we are, the nature of the universe, will go with us wherever we find ourselves to be in the universe. Michael? And the big questions are increasingly been answered by science. And the reason for that is, is that science is following the evidence. Um, I, I, for example, I, I've no particular uh, desire for there to be no God. Um, if, if there was evidence that there was a God, I would just say, oh, I was mistaken. There, there is a God. And so that, that's the, the spirit in which we need to move forward is, is to follow the evidence, try to find out what's real, try not to let our own biases and our, our, our own natural tendency to kind of see agency where, where it isn't there and see patterns where they aren't there and just follow the evidence and, and wherever the evidence leads us and increasingly it's leading us to not needing these supernatural explanations. Mm. But the evidence for me uh, opens up the God question. I mean, I don't live my life in two distinct spheres. One is an astrophysicist uh, and one is a Christian disciple. For me, evidence, just like you, Michael, is absolutely important. For me, the evidence leads me, particularly on the life, death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, to believe that there is a God and that that nature of that God is love and uh, gives science as a gift and many other things are from that. So I agree with you on the importance of evidence. Well, does it lead you then? Think, does it, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go on, Michael. Uh, does it lead you, I know it understands, it leads you to have certain beliefs about Jesus. Does it also lead you to believe that Muhammad flew on a winged horse? I don't know enough about uh, uh, Muslim faith to begin to answer that. Well, how much do you um, need to know about whether there are winged horses? I have to assess the evidence as I come to it within a finite amount of time that I have to do my job and think about religion, just as those on a new planet would have to primarily be selected, first of all, for how good a scientist and engineers they are. Um, there's a limit to just how much evidence I can look at, but that's true in science as well. When I look at how stars form in the universe, I've got a, an amount of evidence. I'd love to have much more. But the constraints of the nature of life, of funding councils, of time on telescopes and all the rest of it, means that I need to get to a point where I've got enough evidence well, to as, make as a Well, as an astrophysicist, then, as, a, as an astrophysicist, do you believe that Muhammad split the moon and two. I don't know enough to ah, you do. As an astrophysicist. That. No, I don't. I think uh, just as there are many things within the Christian Bible that need to be read in context, um, which if you want to ask me about, we can talk about more, but I'm not going to make judgments on a faith community that I don't know much about. Okay, let me bring Beth in at Thank this point. Um, Beth, um, an another challenge will it be, will extraterrestrials, if they do exist on other planets, will they will whatever religion exists on, on planets, will they be converted? Well, that's, that's a difficult question because we can't really imagine other religions and what they might consist of. Um, science fiction has attempted one particular example, I'd suggest, is The Sparrow by mm. uh, Mary Dariah Russell, which suggests that a Jesuit mission to another planet ends rather badly. Um, they don't necessarily go there to convert, but their, their influence on the society unknowing of the structure of the society anthropologically 
leads to disaster and we have to be very sensitive to those sorts of issues if we ever did contact another intelligence i am certain certain religions would want to go out and convert um we might find ourselves converted in return though they might be more convincing than we are Absolutely. What do you make of that, David? <laughs> well, first of all, of course, it's a very long missionary journey for us to start. If we were to go out to where we might think there might be intelligent life, it's going to take us an awful long time. Um, but I don't think that necessarily alien religions would be more advanced or philosophically advanced than earthbound religions. I'm uh, quite interested in a Roman Catholic theologian called Stanley Yaki, who said that in the encounter with E.T., um, religion should be represented because it may be something that not not necessarily divides us but something that may unite us if mm. god is the creator of the universe then we may have common ground with other beings elsewhere in the universe well it's a fascinating debate it will continue no doubt thank you all very much indeed for joining us <laughs> professor david wilkinson anthropologist beth singler and michael nugent from atheist ireland